We've got a first time caller coming in from Nova Scotia, Canada. What's on your mind, caller? Hello? Are you there, caller? You might know Nova Scotia for its high tides, fresh seafood, and kind people. But not many people have heard of the shooting that shook this community only a couple of years ago. What happened? Let me tell you about how 22 people were murdered in two days, from Porter Peak to Enfield. Here's the story of Gabriel Wartman. Warning. What you're about to hear is true. At Hookswitch Hotline, we delve deep into shocking true crimes, including murder, violence, kidnapping, mutilation, and sexual assault. Not for children or the squeamish. Some will find this podcast disturbing. Listener discretion is strongly advised. It's a lot of people shot. People were shot over here on 49 before the light. It's from the bullet thing. All right, and you don't know how many people were shot? No, it's too many people. Okay. All right, we do have help on the way, okay? Gabriel Wartman was a 51-year-old denturist who operated two clinics in Halifax and Dartmouth. He owned real estate in Halifax, Dartmouth, and Porter Peak. His estate, which consisted of six properties and three corporations, was valued at 2.1 million Canadian dollars. He even kept stacks of his money in cash buried on his property due to paranoia about societal collapse following the COVID-19 pandemic. Although Gabriel Wartman owned a cottage in Porter Peak since 2004, he'd been living above his Dartmouth clinic. He had a close friendship and business association with a former Fredericton lawyer who died in November 2009 and left him all of his possessions, including one of the rifles used in the Nova Scotia mass shooting. Gabriel Wartman did not have a possession and acquisition license, which would have been needed to legally possess the rifle. According to his Riverview High School yearbook, Gabriel Wartman aspired to become a police officer. However, his partner informed police after the attacks that Wartman disliked law enforcement and, quote, thought he was better than them, end quote. He had a hobby of buying law enforcement memorabilia and refurbishing old police cruisers. At the time of the mass shooting, he possessed four such cruisers. Police found two of them on fire at his Porter Peak property and a third at his Halifax property, while Wartman initially drove the fourth during the mass shooting. One person called Wartman's home a shrine for the RCMP. He stored two of the vehicles behind his denture clinic. According to a businessman in Dieppe, Wartman inquired about buying a decommissioned RCMP cruiser from him in 2017 or 2018, claiming to be a retired police officer who wanted to park the vehicle outside the house to deter thieves. For price reasons, he didn't buy it. A witness claimed Wartman tended to dress up in a police uniform and role play. On at least four occasions, police were alerted to the gunman's behavior. In 2001, he reportedly assaulted a 15-year-old boy. In June 2010, Wartman was investigated by Halifax Regional Police for threatening his parents, but no official action was taken due to a lack of evidence. In May 2011, Truro Police received a tip from an unnamed source via email about Wartman's stash of guns and his desire to, quote, kill a cop. The tipster warned about Wartman's recent stress and mental health issues and said that he always kept a handgun close by. The tip was transferred to the Nova Scotia RCMP for jurisdictional reasons, but it is unclear what action was taken by them. The tip was ultimately purged from their records, as is standard protocol according to an RCMP spokesperson. A former neighbor in Porta Peak said he reported Wartman to the RCMP in the summer of 2013 for assaulting his spouse and having a cache of illegal firearms. But the RCMP declined to take firmer action due to not receiving a complaint from the partner. The former neighbor ended up leaving Porta Peak after Wartman became more aggressive and threatening to his spouse in response to the complaint. The RCMP confirmed that they had received the neighbor's complaint, but that the file had since been purged from their records. Wartman had previously pleaded guilty to assault in 2002 and was sentenced to nine months of probation, in which he was prohibited from possessing weapons and ordered to undergo anger management counseling. Gabriel Wartman was also involved in two civil lawsuits regarding property disputes, according to interviews and public records. In 2004, he offered to help a friend who was having financial difficulties and was about to lose his house, then discreetly took ownership of the house, evicted the man, and sold the property. In 2015, Wartman's uncle lent him a house that he had purchased in Porta Peak while he was selling his Edmonton condominium. 
Wartman refused to release the property back to him, claiming he was owed money, until the uncle eventually sold it. One of the buyers later became a victim in the mass shooting. Residents were suspicious that Wartman was stockpiling gasoline and propane tanks, and they reported hearing him brag about having lime and muriatic acid to dispose of bodies. Neighbors also said that Wartman struggled with alcohol use and his business was negatively affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, which forced all non-essential denture services in Nova Scotia to close. According to his spouse, Wartman, who took her across Nova Scotia in the hours before the attacks, had been consumed by the pandemic for weeks and believed he was going to die. He was also fearful that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau would begin controlling money, which prompted him to make hefty bank withdrawals. Additionally, Wartman communicated with an acquaintance via email about how other people were not prepared for it and how he was well-armed in advance and how he was, quote, well-armed far in advance. Where's your emergency? No. Nah, well, well, we have, we have, it's, it's a victim shot. Victim shot. Okay, honey, where's, where are they shot at? 49. 49. I got the address. I got the address, but where at on the body? Come, 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 come. Where are they shot at on the body? Come on, where's your emergency? Yeah, dude, we got the cops up on him, though. We have the 49. Somebody we have. We have it. Listen to me. We have them on the way. Yeah, I'm 49. I'm 49. Stop yelling at me, honey. Honey, listen. Stop yelling. We have them on the way. Where are they shot at? Oh, my God. I'm about to have a pin. I cannot see you. Please, oh, my God. Where are they shot at on the body? They're in the house. I don't know. I can't see. I can't see. Okay, well, make sure you get in a safe place, okay? Get in a safe place. We have help on the way. All right, bye. For most of the 13-hour crime spree, Wartman was driving a replica RCMP cruiser and may have been wearing parts of an RCMP uniform. On December 4, three people, including Wartman's partner, were charged with supplying him with ammunition later used in the attacks. Police were criticized for not using Alert Ready, the national warning system in Canada, to warn the public about the attacks as well as not responding to reports of Wartman's behavior in previous acts of domestic violence. An investigation into law enforcement's response to the rampage, including the decision not to use Alert Ready, was launched. A public inquiry into the law enforcement response was declared on July 28th, following escalating criticism of the investigation's lack of transparency. The attacks are the deadliest rampage in Canadian history. It all began in the seaside community of Porta Peak, which has a year-round population of just 100 people and 30 homes, no sidewalks, and no streetlights. 13 people would die in the rural enclave over a 40-minute period, while another nine would be killed the next day. The first 911 call to police came from the home of Greg and Jamie Blair. When Wartman assaulted his partner, he poured gasoline throughout their cottage and set the residence on fire. Wartman then forced his partner to walk to their nearby warehouse and confined her to the backseat of his replica RCMP cruiser. She was able to escape and hid in the woods until early the next morning. Wartman then set the warehouse on fire. Beginning at 10.01 p.m., a number of Porter Peak residents called 911 to report gunshots and several fires. Some say the first call came from the wife of a victim. Others believe the first 911 call came to the police from Greg and Jamie Blair. According to inquiry documents, Jamie called 911 at 12.01 p.m. local time on Saturday to say that a man she identified as Gabriel had just shot her husband outside and had parked a fake police car in their driveway. She said, There's a police car. It's decked and labeled RCMP, but it's not, unquote, according to a transcript of the call. Warman then entered the home and killed her in her bedroom while she was on the phone with 911. Her two children, ages 9 and 11, were hidden nearby. The woman was shot and killed while barricading a bedroom door and protecting her two sons. Wartman then attempted to set the house on fire, but the two sons escaped from the home. A third son of the victim said he believes Wartman targeted his father first during the attacks because he owned rifles and would have been able to stop him. At about 10.05 p.m., Wartman reportedly returned to his burning house where he killed a woman living across the street who had mistaken him for an RCMP officer responding to the fire. The woman's children took the two sons of the first victims and together they hid for several hours while on the phone with 911 waiting to be rescued. At 10.10 p.m., two of Wartman's neighbors drove to his house to investigate the fire while calling 911. 
Along the way, they passed by the house of a couple Wartman had shot and killed, and they noticed what appeared to be a police car parked out front with its roof lights off. After confirming Wartman's house was on fire, the two drove back and encountered the same police car fleeing the scene of another house fire. As they pulled alongside the police car, Wartman fired at them with a handgun, injuring the driver in the shoulder. The two managed to flee in their vehicle. First responders also found the neighbors that Wartman shot at. They identified Wartman by name and said that he had gone toward the beach and that there was also another unmapped exit from the neighborhood. They also informed the officers that Wartman was in a replica police vehicle, which was also previously reported by several 911 calls. At 11.32 p.m., the RCMP posted a tweet saying it was dealing with, quote, a firearms complaint, and it asked residents of the Porta Peak area to stay inside with their doors locked, as officers, as officers set up a search perimeter of about 1.2 miles. Despite multiple warnings from witnesses and others about the fake cop car, it was only at 10.17 a.m. the next day, more than 12 hours later, that police posted a public warning about the replica RCMP cruiser on Twitter. The fake cop car may have helped Wartman avoid detection, police said after the shooting, and the families of some victims have said that it clearly caught their loved ones unawares. Overnight, there was still confusion over whether Wartman had been apprehended and if he was the driver of the apparent police car. At the time, the RCMP was unable to use a helicopter to assist in the manhunt because their only Atlantic-based helicopter was unavailable due to routine maintenance. The RCMP later determined that Wartman had left Porta Peak at around 10.45 p.m., 19 minutes after the police first responded, by driving through a dirt road along a blueberry field, which the officers did not block off. Other witnesses' evidence suggests that Wartman had left through the dirt road before 10.38 p.m., or had left via an alternate route altogether. After escaping, he spent the night parked behind a welding shop in the DeBert area, about 16 miles east of Porta Peak. There, he left behind police equipment and gun-related items in a ditch on the property of a resident he knew. At some point after, the RCMP's emergency response team responded to Porta Peak. Before then, residents reported seeing little to no law enforcement in the area, despite seeing fires and making 911 calls to report gunshots. At 5.43 a.m., Wartman left Durbert and drove north on Highway 4 to a house whose residence he knew, located on Hunter Road in Wentworth, approximately 37 kilometers north of Porta Peak. It's believed he actually spent about six hours overnight in an industrial park in a community about 24 kilometers away. He began his killing spree again sometime between 6.35 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. on Sunday morning in Wentworth, a hamlet about 45 kilometers from Porta Peak. There, he shot Alana Jenkins and Sean McLeod and set their home on fire before killing their neighbor, Tom Bagley. He arrived at around 6.30 a.m. and shortly thereafter killed the two occupants and their dogs. Wartman then remained at the house for about three hours. What he did during that time was unclear. Around that time, police located Wentworth's spouse in Porta Peak. She had fled to a neighbor's home to call 911 since Wentworth had smashed her cell phone. She was barefoot and claimed to have been hiding outdoors for much of the night. She confirmed that he was impersonating a police officer and provided a photo of his replica police vehicle. An all points bulletin alert containing this updated information was issued to officers across the province at around 8 a.m. Warning Wentworth could be anywhere in Nova Scotia. However, the RCMP publicly announced that they were dealing with an active shooter situation in Porta Peak at 8.02 a.m. Wartman was publicly identified as the suspect at 8.54 a.m. Wartman eventually set the house he was staying in on fire. As he left, he killed a neighbor who had been out for a walk when he saw the fire and tried to help. Wartman then began driving back south on Highway 4 toward Porta Peak at 9.23 a.m. and at 9.35 a.m. he shot and killed another victim while she was walking on the side of the road in Wentworth Valley. At around 9.45, he went to another house in Glenholm whose residence he knew, while armed and dressed in a police uniform. However, the occupants recognized him and refused to let him in. Wartman attempted to trick them into thinking he was an officer involved in the manhunt by calling out his own name and shouting, come out with your hands up, but the occupants called the police and he left. By 9.48, Wartman was seen near a campground in Glenholm. Before 10, in Durbert, Wartman performed two traffic stops on random cars a few hundred meters apart and killed their occupants. He was seen at 10 a.m. traveling through Durbert and Onslow. 
In a tweet posted at 10.17 a.m., the RCMP first warned the public that Wartman was impersonating a police officer and shared the photo of his vehicle. At the Onslow Belmont Fire Hall, which had been set up as a shelter for the victims from Porta Peak, two RCMP officers mistook an emergency management officer for Wartman and opened fire without any warning. They missed their target and continued their manhunt without checking on the occupants of the fire hall. Wartman was recorded on surveillance video passing through Truro at around 10.20 a.m. and then Millbrook First Nation at 10.25 a.m where he briefly stopped in a parking lot to exchange his jacket for a reflective vest. Sometime before 10.49 a.m., Wartman pulled alongside RCMP Constable Chad Morrison's cruiser at the intersection of Route 2 and Route 224 in Shubenacadie, about 30 miles from DeBert. Morrison had planned to meet fellow officer Heidi Stevenson at that location. Wartman shot into the car with a handgun, injuring Morrison who fled down Route 2 and took shelter at an empty paramedic station. He was eventually found by paramedics and was transported to the hospital. Wartman proceeded less than 2,000 feet south into the junction with Route 224 and collided head-on with Stevenson, who was driving north. Stevenson then engaged Wartman, resulting in him returning fire and killing her. Immediately after the engagement, he stole her sidearm and remaining ammunition before setting both cars on fire. Wartman then shot and killed a nearby motorist who had stopped to help Stevenson and drove off in that victim's silver Chevrolet Tracker SUV. Police announced the vehicle change at 10.06 a.m. Shortly thereafter, Wartman drove to Shabinikati and killed a woman he knew, entered her home, changed his clothes again, and stole her Mazda 3 car. Over 13 hours after police had begun pursuing him, at 11.26, Wartman stopped to refuel at the Irving Big Shop service area in Enfield, 57 miles south of Porta Peak, 25 miles north of Halifax. Hubley and his partner encountered the gunman at a gas station by chance. Officer Hubley recognized the killer immediately. In my mind, I was 100% sure it was a perpetrator. The killer was no longer in his fake police car and was no longer wearing a police uniform. He was wearing a white t-shirt and he looked very sweaty, very run down. I think I've used the word animal to describe him. What I remember seeing is his arm come up. Which arm? His right arm. There was a silver pistol in his hand, and it was at that point that I began firing. Right away I knew it was an RCMP issued pistol. Um, and it's at that time I, uh, I believed he was, uh, he was going to uh, try to shoot either myself or Craig, and I, I made the decision to start shooting him. Wartman raised Stevenson's sidearm to his head and fired, whereupon the officers fatally shot him. We've all struggled. We, uh, we saw a lot that night, uh, and every one of us, um, every one of us just wanted to find him. Wartman's death was confirmed by police at 11.40 a.m. According to a partially redacted document, Wartman's spouse said that he had been on his way to Halifax on the day of the mass shooting to get someone, and that local authorities had had to go to a residence to provide protection for its two occupants. Wartman killed 22 people, including Constable Heidi Stevenson. The other officer he shot, Constable Chad Morrison, survived, as did the man he shot in Porta Peak who first reported his possible use of a fake police car. He tied up and injured his spouse before she escaped at the start of the rampage. Thirteen of the dead were found in Porta Peak, four in Wentworth, two in DeBert, and three in Shabinacati. They are believed to have died from gunshot wounds. Eight of the victims were found in the remains of structure fires. Wartman also killed two dogs and injured two other dogs. According to RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky, some of Wartman's first victims were closely connected to him, but over time, those he attacked were selected more at random. The Globe and Mail reported that one of the victims in Wentworth had previously gone hunting with Wartman, while CBC News reported that another victim owned the property in Porter Peak that was subject to a dispute between Wartman and his uncle. The victims of this horrendous massacre include Greg and Jamie Blair, Jolene Oliver, Aaron Tuck, and their daughter, Emily Tuck, as well as Joy and Peter Bond, Lisa McCulley, Frank and Don Gulenshin, Joanne Thomas, and John Zoll. Corey Ellison, Alana Jenkins, and Sean McLeod, Tom Bagley, Lillian Campbell, Christian Beaton, Heather O'Brien, Constable Heidi Stevenson, Joseph Weber, and Gina Goulet. With every crime, someone somewhere has information. That someone could be you. Email us at hookswitchhotline at gmail.com or leave a message at 415-448-7263.
Thank you for joining us on this episode of Hook Switch Hotline. Join us next week when we'll dive deep into more graphic true crime.